the most dangerous of obstetrical complications with hazardous implications for the mother and infant is antepartum hemorrhage today i am going to discuss one of the most important causes of antepartum hemorrhage that is placenta previa first some basics hemorrhage in pregnancy has different causes bleeding in pregnancy from conception to viability that is up to 24 weeks of gestation is called miscarriage bleeding occurring from the period of viability up to delivery including the first and second stage of labor is called as antepartum hemorrhage which is what i will be discussing today bleeding occurring during the third stage of labor and after delivery is referred to as postpartum hemorrhage bleeding that occurs in the first 24 hours of delivery including hemorrhage during labor is called as primary postpartum hemorrhage whereas that occurring after 24 hours is called secondary postpartum hemorrhage antepartum hemorrhage is defined as hemorrhage from the genital tract occurring after the fetus has reached viability that is 24-28 weeks but before birth of the baby which includes first and second stage hemorrhage the incidence of antepartum hemorrhage is approximately 3% of all hospital deliveries causes of antepartum hemorrhage are divided into following categories placental causes are placenta previa which accounts for 35% of cases and abruptio placentae that account for another 35% the extra placental causes are varicosity of vaginal veins cervical erosion cervical polyp and carcinoma of cervix these four causes are also referred to as local causes of bleeding Besides this antepartum hemorrhage has miscellaneous causes such as rupture of marginal sinus vasa previa circumvallate placenta excessive show rupture of uterus and coagulopathies despite all these causes in small percentage of cases the cause is undetermined and now i will discuss one of the most important causes of antepartum hemorrhage that is placenta previa placenta previa can lead to severe bleeding and is potentially fatal to both mother and the fetus placenta previa is defined as a condition that results when any part of the placenta implants on the lower uterine segment and may or may not cover the internal os of the cervix the definition of placenta previa has changed over time it was defined as location of the placenta within 3 inches that is 7.5 cm from the internal os in 1969 now it is within 2 cm of the internal os a little out of the box thinking from the point of view of the fetus the fetus must be wondering how the heck am i going to come out in the discussion that follows that is what we'll find out according to older terminology that is not used anymore there are following types of placenta previa type 1 which is called as lateral placenta previa type 2 which is called as marginal type 2a is anterior and type 2b is posterior which is also known as stallworth is dangerous placenta previa when it covers the internal loss partially or totally it is known as central placenta previa type 3 is incomplete central and type 4 is complete central the terms lateral and marginal are no longer used as they refer to information gathered on digital vaginal examination which should be avoided and is no longer needed given the superiority of ultrasound diagnosis modern ultrasound based classification of placenta previa is as follows low lying placenta that is placental edge is less than 20 or according to some 30 mm from the internal os but 
not covering the internal loss placenta partially covering the internal loss and placenta totally covering the internal loss incidence of placenta pvia varies from 0.5 to 3.5% the overall incidence of placenta pvia is about 4 per 1000 births in india it is higher that is 5 out of every 1000 births an interesting fact is that the incidence of placenta pvia decreases as gestational age advances the incidence is 20% at 20 weeks of gestation and around 0.5% at term The risk of placenta pvia after cesarean section is higher at 1%. Risk factors for placenta pvia are previous placenta pvia is an independent risk factor for recurrence which occurs in 4 to 8% of subsequent pregnancies. Previous cesarean delivery. The risk increases with an increasing number of cesarean deliveries. The risk is higher with pre labor cesarean delivery than with intrapartum cesarean delivery multiple pregnancies other independent risk factors are advanced maternal age multiparity smoking prior medical termination of pregnancy previous uterine surgical procedure and for some strange reason male fetus why does the placenta implant on the lower uterine segment The exact etiopathogenesis of placenta pvia is unknown. One hypothesis is that areas of suboptimally vascularized decidua resulting from previous surgery or multiple pregnancies promote implantation of trophoblast on lower uterine segment or unidirectional growth of trophoblast towards lower uterine cavity. Another hypothesis is that a particularly large placental surface area such as in multiple gestation increases the probability that the placenta will encroach upon the lower uterine segment or cervical os approximately 90% of placenta pvias identified on ultrasound examination before 20 weeks of gestation resolve before delivery two theories have been proposed to account for this phenomenon The lower uterine segment lengthens from 5 mm at 20 weeks of gestation to more than 50 mm at term. This progressive development of the lower uterine segment, especially in the second and third trimester of pregnancy, relocates the stationary lower edge of the placenta away from the internal loss. This is the so-called placental migration theory. There is another explanation which is as follows since the lower uterine segment is relatively less vascular than other parts of the myometrium the placenta preferentially grows at its more cephaloid position this leads to a progressive unidirectional growth of trophoblastic tissue towards the fundus resulting in an upward migration of the placenta away from the cervix this phenomenon has been termed trophotropism Another way to put it is that there is differential atrophy of the placental edge at the lower end and hypertrophy of the placental villi at the other that is upper edge. In either case the placental edge overlying the cervix atrophies. Now I will discuss why vaginal bleeding occurs in a case of placenta pvia in the later months of pregnancy that is pathophysiology of bleeding. Bleeding occurs because there is avulsion of the anchoring villi as a result of progressive stretching of the lower uterine segment as it develops in the second half of pregnancy. It occurs in stages and is thus episodic. Coming to clinical features, the first thing that I want to emphasize is that both placenta pvia and abruptio placentae produce vaginal bleeding late in pregnancy. but there is a stark difference bleeding in placenta pvia is painless whereas that in abruption is painful vaginal bleeding from placenta pvia is typically described as painless recurrent and apparently causeless causeless not because we do not know the cause but because the patient feels it happened for no apparent reason 
Often the only symptom is painless vaginal bleeding. The blood is usually bright red in color and ranges in volume from scant to heavy that is from a few ml to maximum 200 to 300 ml. Since the initial bleeding episode is small, usually it regresses spontaneously. Bleeding episodes may recur as pregnancy progresses. In some patients, profuse postcoital bleeding can occur because of central placenta previa. Bleeding can also be precipitated by straining at defecation. An interesting fact to remember is that about 20% of these patients give some history of bleeding in the first trimester. Most bleeding episodes of placenta previa do not produce hypovolemic shock because the blood volume of pregnant women is 7 to 7.5 liters as compared to normal adult volume of 5 liters because of physiological changes in blood volume. It is because of this that pregnant women can easily withstand a loss of 200 to 400 ml of blood in placenta previa. Signs of gestational hypertension are absent. This is another differentiating feature from abruptio placentae. On abdominal palpation, fundal height corresponds to the period of amenorrhea. Uterus is soft, relaxed, fetal parts are fed easily. In cephalic presentation, the head is high floating because the low-lying placenta prevents engagement of head. Malpresentations like oblique lie, transverse lie, breach are more common. That is, they are seen in about 30% of cases. It is important to keep in mind that per vaginal examination is contraindicated if this condition is suspected because in case of central placenta previa, it can provoke torrential vaginal bleeding. In cases of marginal placenta previa, where the placenta is implanted on the posterior wall of the uterus, which is known as Stolwadi's type 2b placenta, during per abdominal palpation, when one pushes the fetal head into the pelvis, the fetal heart sounds become irregular and become normal as soon as the pressure on the head is released. This is called positive Stolwadi sign. This happens because the central thickened portion of the placenta gets compressed between the sacral promontory and the head. Type 2b placenta also prevents engagement of head at term. In the next few slides, I will take a deep dive into the role of ultrasonography in the diagnosis of placenta previa. In modern obstetrics, low-lying placenta or placenta previa is diagnosed on a routine ultrasound examination at approximately 16 to 20 weeks of gestation. However, most of these early diagnoses do not persist to term and early diagnosis may invoke unnecessary anxiety to patients and increase cause because of follow-up ultrasound examinations. In cases diagnosed to have a low-lying placenta or placenta previa in the mid-trimester, a repeat ultrasonography should be performed at 32 weeks to know whether it has resolved or is still persisting. If the placental edge is greater than or equal to 2 cm from the internal loss, the placental position is reported as normal and additional follow-up ultrasound examinations for placental position are not indicated. On the other hand, if the placental edge covers or is less than 2 cm from the internal loss, a follow-up transvaginal ultrasound for placental position is indicated at 36 weeks. If the placental edge covers the internal loss, cesarean birth is scheduled as the previa is likely to persist until time of birth. Transabdominal ultrasonography is the standard initial sonographic approach in most pregnant women. So the question is, can a transvaginal ultrasound be done? Transvaginal ultrasound can be performed safely in patients with placenta previa since the optimal position of the vaginal probe for visualization of the internal loss is 20 to 30 millimeters away from the cervix and the angle between the cervix and vaginal probe is sufficient to prevent the probe from inadvertently slipping into the cervical canal. Transvaginal ultrasonography generally provides 
a clearer image of the relationship between the age of the placenta and the internal cervical loss than trans abdominal ultrasound examination trans labial or trans perineal ultrasound imaging is an alternative technique to trans vaginal ultrasound as it provides excellent images of the cervix and the placenta sagittal parasagittal and transverse sonographic views should be obtained with the patient's bladder partially full Now let's see some actual cases. These two pictures illustrate the difference in relationship between a trans abdominal and trans vaginal sonography for the diagnosis of placenta fibia. The picture on the right is a trans vaginal ultrasound examination. Remember the endovaginal probe must be 3 to 4 cm away from the external loss. The picture on the left is a trans abdominal ultrasonography showing central placenta fibia. because the placenta is completely covering the internal loss this is a trans abdominal ultrasound examination done at 24 weeks where the placental edge is less than 20 mm from the internal loss suggesting a low lying placenta some centers consider 30 mm as the diagnostic threshold once this is found the sonologist should not label the patient as a case of placenta fibia but just call her for repeat ultrasound examinations as mentioned earlier why i will elaborate in the next slide approximately 90% of placenta fibias identified on ultrasound examination before 20 weeks of gestation resolve before delivery so the question is can we predict which cases will persist as placenta fibia findings that suggest that a placenta will persist until delivery as previa include extension of the placenta over the internal loss by more than 25 mm and posterior placenta fibia the more the placenta extends over the internal loss the more likely it is to persist until delivery although available data are insufficient to make precise predictions full data suggests that at 18 to 24 weeks of gestation when the placenta extends less than 14 mm over the internal loss the probability of placenta fibia at delivery is near zero if it is greater than or equal to 14 mm but less than 25 mm over the internal loss the probability of placenta fibia at delivery is approximately 20% if it extends more than 25 mm over the internal loss the probability of placenta fibia at delivery ranges from 40 to 100% and it is 100% if it extends more than 55 mm over the internal loss color doppler should be employed in previa cases in which an abnormally attached placenta for example placenta accreta spectrum is suspected it is also used to exclude vasa previa when the umbilical cord is in the lower uterine segment MRI is most useful for diagnosis of complicated placenta fibia cases such as previa accreta spectrum. Since the patient is bleeding, other laboratory investigations that may be required are complete blood count, especially platelet count, blood group Rh typing and cross matching, coagulation profile including bleeding time clotting time prothrombin time partial thromboplastin time inr and fibrin degradation products the management of placenta fibia cases is best addressed in terms of the patient's clinical setting whether she is asymptomatic acute care of antepartum bleeding patients and expectant management of stable patients after a bleed I will discuss them one by one. The algorithm shown here depicts the management in asymptomatic patients. If early ultrasound diagnosis is made, patient is counseled but not alarmed and a repeat trans abdominal sonography is done at 32 weeks. If it has migrated upwards, it is no more previa. No additional investigation or management is needed. If it is still less than 2 cm from the internal loss or covering it partially or totally it is an established case of placenta fibia and should be managed as such 
if it is just a low lying placenta patient can be given a trial of labor but if it is covering the internal loss totally or partially patient is advised cesarean delivery at term after counseling her about the higher maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality obviously the patient should be managed in a tertiary care hospital with a senior experienced obstetrician delivering her whether vaginally or by cesarean i will now talk briefly about the expectant management of placenta previa that was very popular in the pre ultrasound era it is still asked in post graduate examinations it is known as the expectant treatment of johnson and mcafee who first described it prerequisites for expectant management are initial bout less than 600 ml patient should not be in labor fetus should be alive fetal and maternal condition should not be in immediate jeopardy protocol is as follows blood should be grouped and cross matched every 3 days complete bed rest sedatives treat blood loss adequately with intravenous fluid or if required blood transfusion laxatives to facilitate bowel movement hematidics and vitamins should be continued calcium supplement in high doses if massive blood transfusion has been given administer a course of corticosteroids 48 hours before a planned cesarean delivery which is scheduled at less than 37 weeks of gestation to facilitate fetal lung maturity patient should be monitored closely in the hospital monitor pulse blood pressure fetal heart sounds blood loss that is number of pads change per day hemoglobin every 3 to 4 days 3 days after bleeding has stopped do a gentle pulse pregnancy examination to rule out any local causes of bleeding of course an ultrasound should be done to confirm the diagnosis if it has not been done earlier ambulation may be allowed after bleeding has stopped it is preferable to keep her hospitalized till 37 weeks of gestation expectant line of treatment of johnson and mccarthy should be discontinued if another severe bout occurs or if patient goes in labor otherwise it is continued until 37 weeks various interventions have been proposed to reduce the risk of bleeding there is consensus that digital cervical examination should be avoided it is clear from anecdotal experience that palpation of placenta previa through a partially dilated cervix can result in severe hemorrhage advise patients with placenta previa after 20 weeks of gestation to avoid any sexual activity that may lead to orgasm the rationale is that this activity especially if orgasm occurs may be associated with transient uterine contractions which in turn may provoke bleeding additionally there is a concern that vaginal intercourse of putting any object deep into the vagina might cause direct trauma to the previa resulting in bleeding the patient is also advised to avoid moderate or strenuous exercise that is heavy lifting for example more than approximately 20 pounds or standing for prolonged periods of time for example more than 4 hours indications for delivery are severe and persistent vaginal bleeding such that maternal hemodynamic stability cannot be achieved or maintained significant vaginal bleeding after 34 plus 0 weeks of gestation or when patient goes into active labor or if the baby dies since most cases of placenta previa are delivered by cesarean in modern obstetrics i will discuss it in great details first preparation make 2 to 4 units of packed blood cells available preoperative or intraoperative sonographic placenta localization is useful senior experienced obstetrician must perform the cesarean delivery the surgeon should try to avoid disrupting the placenta when entering the uterus if the placenta is in size hemorrhage from vessels can result in significant maternal anemia therefore the fetus should be delivered rapidly and the cord promptly clamped 
if the placenta is in an anterolateral location a vertical incision can be made in the lower uterine segment on the opposite anterolateral side of the placenta if the placenta wraps around the cervix from the anterior to posterior lower uterine segment in the midline a transverse or a vertical incision above it may be possible although a vertical incision often results in extension into the upper uterine segment now i will turn my attention to placenta pivia especially when it is on the anterior wall in this situation access the membranes by insinuating fingers between the placenta and uterine wall till you reach the membranes which are then ruptured to access the fetus shown by blue arrow or cut through the placenta quickly deliver the baby and cut the cord immediately before closing the uterus check for any active bleeding from the placental bed suture them with under running sutures if uterus fails to contract despite medical treatment then as a last resort one may have to do cesarean hysterectomy bilateral internal artery ligation or what i prefer stepwise devascularization of the uterus lastly like in a case of abruptio placenta is it possible to confirm the diagnosis of placenta pivia after vaginal delivery yes Examine the placenta and membranes. Location of the opening of the fetal membranes from the placental edge indicates placenta pivia. The distance from opening being equal to the distance between the placental edge and the internal os. The patient should be observed closely for development of postpartum hemorrhage in the postpartum period. If you want to know more about this topic or any other topic in obstetrics and gynecology please refer to my books modern gynecology modern obstetrics and practical obstetrics and gynecology and other books the links are given below they are available on amazon.in for purchase inquiries contact me on this whatsapp number I have also published two question answer books which are particularly useful for exam going students. These are Clinical Cases in Obstetrics 1000 plus questions and answers and Clinical Cases in Gynecology 1000 plus questions and answers. These are also available on amazon.in. You can also follow me on other social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. The links are given here. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, share it with your friends and also subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Thank you for watching.